your book, you reflect on the enormous debt um, that's owed to the men and women who fought and won World War II and subsequently created the institutions that rebuilt Europe and um, detained and defeated, uh, contained and defeated communism. Uh, these institutions played a key role in, in shaping the world for the last 50, 60 years. Um, NATO, you argue, is foremost amongst those. In researching your book and revisiting these historic events that have defined the modern era, how has your views changed, if they have changed, on the importance of these institutions, particularly NATO? Well, first of all, what I think is interesting is I spent more time in doing research on the book looking at the interwar period, which um, had a huge effect, obviously, in, in everything that had happened. Um, and one of the reasons, I believe, that the British and French acted the way they did was that they had suffered a great deal during World War I. The scars of World War I were very evident, and not only in terms of the numbers of uh, young men who had died, but, but generally in terms of how democracies comported themselves. And also, there were attempts by the powers that be to develop some kind of an international system. The League of Nations existed. There was the Kellogg-Briand Pact in order to outlaw war. There were attempts at disarmament, and none of that really worked. America was very kind of literally distant um, in that particular way and had stayed out of things. And yet, once um, that, uh, every, people know the story in terms of Lend-Lease and bringing America in, and the relationship between Churchill and Roosevelt, they began to think about what kind of a system should exist after World War II. That is when the United Nations came into existence in their minds and trying to figure out what were the weaknesses of the inner war structure so that they could develop something that worked. And they began to talk about a North Atlantic, um, an Atlantic relationship. Um, one of the things that I talk about in the book is, I mean, they're kind of three layers. The inner layer is the personal story. The second layer is the World War II setting. And the third is about, uh, the importance of leaders, individuals, decision making. And one of the things I talk about is that leaders can't operate on wishful thinking. So Chamberlain hoped that Hitler would change, and Roosevelt hoped that Stalin would change. And so to some extent, um, the post-war immediate alliances were still based on the fact that we could be allies with the Soviet Union. And yet, what the Soviets were doing was systematically accumulating their satellite empire by a series of kind of salami tactics of um, go subverting governments. The direct link between what happened in Czechoslovakia and NATO is, very, to me, very clear. The communists took over in February 1948, and finally, uh, Americans, Truman, figured out what was going on, and so they built on some of the aspects of the Marshall Plan and the Truman Doctrine in order to develop this alliance, NATO, the most powerful military alliance in the history of the world. And what I think was it served its purpose very, very well during the Cold War. It protected, it provided a nuclear umbrella to Western Europe. Uh, it did um, create its antithesis, which is the Warsaw Pact, and so right. you had these two alliances facing each other. So the Cold War ends, uh, the Warsaw Pact is disbanded, and the West doesn't want to disband NATO. In fact, what happens is the countries that were artificially divided by the Cold War wanted to be parts of NATO. And so one of the things that uh, we did during the Clinton administration was to systematically expand NATO. And so you can imagine kind of the personal um, oh, sure. thrill of when I was there in, at, uh, on Truman's desk in Independence, Missouri, welcoming Hungary, the, uh, Poland, and the Czech Republic into NATO. And then it has systematically expanded. So the question is, what is it supposed to do? Right. And again, because life is amazingly peculiar, my father had been the Czechoslovak ambassador to Yugoslavia. And I, uh, the 90s begin, Yugoslavia begins to fall apart, 
Uh, and so what do we do about it? And I was ambassador at the United Nations mm -hmm. uh, when we were pushing to do something about it. And actually, we, the Clinton administration, were the first to ever take NATO to war. It had, in fact, been an alliance that That's had never right. had to go to war. Right. And what it began to do, instead of just protecting its members, it began to act what we call out of area, meaning that it did things outside of the membership. And what it was doing in the Balkans was the first thing. So that was something that you sat down and decided you were going to do Absolutely. out of area. What was it? Because the issue was, what was this alliance that was against the Soviet Union going right. to do? Right. Um, and it was not just a military alliance, but also a political, political. alliance, right. because it insisted that the members be democratic uh, and that there be civilian control over the military. And so one of the more difficult things I had to do when, I, um, when we were doing this was to go and talk to President Yeltsin and say, uh, uh, you know, this is what we're doing. And he said, well, this is a new Russia. You don't need NATO. And I said, it's a new NATO. Uh, it is different, and in fact, we made clear that if the Russians had a democratic government and wanted to, that they ultimately could be members of NATO. This was not against them. So what NATO has done now, and this is one of the things that's going to be talked about here during the right. summit, is what are the out-of-area responsibilities of NATO? Obviously, Afghanistan is the major one. Libya was something that was a NATO uh, campaign and so this alliance that was set up against the Soviets now has a different mission and I think that's the interesting part about what has to be talked about in terms of alliance structures.